Through the calendars, date still I, monumental inscriptions, regnal lists, annals and timekeeping systems from the ancient world all the way to today, there is a hidden calendar embedded into the structure of reality. Unbroken, perfect, found in the writings of our predecessors, mentioned by writers thousands of years ago. Every 138 years it brings changes to our world, edits, resets, and then disguises these changes under the guise of natural disasters. The Phoenix Phenomenon causes mud floods, resets, mass vanishings, edits of history altering the trajectory of social and political events, introduces new materials, new translations to older texts, strange phenomena. A small window of time in the month of May, every 138 years, when the veil between our world and somewhere else is rent open and there is an exchange of materials. At Archaics.com and the Archaics YouTube channel, you will find in numerous examples and data sets showing you that this strange overseer protocol has totally forged the unfolding of historical events and will return in May of 2040. Our world is not what you think. The concept of a vapor canopy was introduced in 1912 by Isaac Vail in the book The Canopy and Longevity of Life. Vail was also the first to appeal to the water canopy's greenhouse effect to advocate a universally warm earth. The first to claim that this would result in no rain on the earth and the first to claim that the blocking of the sun's rays would lead to great longevity among humankind. It would be 24 more years before the concept was seriously revisited. Harry Rimmer embraced the canopy in his 1936 work, The Harmony of Science and Scripture, stating the earth was surrounded by a protecting lens of ice that made the whole world an Eden of tropical splendor. In the same year, Kellogg published his research. After an analysis of numerous mythological accounts of the ancient earth, Kellogg concluded that many, many of these traditions tell of a visible watery, watery heaven scintillating with light. This is in The Coming Kingdom and the Recanopied Earth 1936 on page 23. Still, it would be another 25 years before the concept would return and be widely received. In 1961, the combined work of researchers and scientists Whitcomb and Morris in the book The Genesis Flood has presented the most persuasive and well-documented case for the vapor canopy. So much so that the scientific community now began to defend itself against the concept because the uniformitarian model of science cannot allow for a historical vapor canopy. In 1968, Donald Patton published an amazing book that theorized that a vapor canopy once enshrouded our world and this was the antediluvian period, seven years after the book was published, The Genesis Flood. But in Patton's work, The Biblical Flood and the Ice Epic, he added more details, more research, and a better scenario for explaining the historic anomalies. The capture of long-wave radiation resulted in a greenhouse effect diffusing light and warmth into the polar regions, creating a uniform temperature all year long. Summer and winter were not dissimilar, and years were counted by stellar revolutions. Diurnal motion observed at night around the pole star Alpha Draconis. The Earth once had a vapor canopy like Venus has today, but basically his theory, and he went further and provided evidence for his belief that the vapor canopy collapsed and caused the Great Flood because of the proximity of an unknown planetary body. And this intruder was, as you have guessed, the Phoenix. 
21 years later, Joseph Dillo in The Waters Above, Earth's Pre-Flood Vapor Canopy. This book was published in 1982. Dillo lists a number of traditional accounts that demonstrate a memory of the canopy. The effects of the canopy is no longer theoretical. Creationist scientists in Glen Rose, Texas have built a hyperbaric biosphere, a chamber where they replicated the canopy conditions and the result was much larger plant life forms inside this containment field. The lifespan of fruit flies was tripled and similar organi organisms underwent changes. They have used this biosphere to increase the size of fruit flies, other insects, and plants that grew to astonishing dimensions in, inside this replicated vapor canopy condition. An interesting aside in my own personal life in the 1980s when I was young, when I was in a youth choir at First Baptist Bedford, I visited Glen Rose State Park twice in my youth or Dinosaur National Park as it's called today. I laid down inside the gigantic tracks of some ancient monster petrified in the Paluxy River Basin. I have seen these with my own eyes. I, I have also seen the videos years later when scientists broke the shale across, across other areas and vast tracks of the Paluxy River to show scientists that these prehistoric tracks continued unabated. It's crazy. As Glen Rose Dinosaur Park is in North America, it is North America where we have preserved very old traditional memories of the vapor canopy. According to the Aztec traditions inscribed upon the Stone of the Fifth Sun, exhibited at the Yale Peabody Museum, these people believed that Earth was flooded in antiquity. They knew that an evil race of giants oppressed their ancestors. In the annals of Coatitlan, is revealed that the rain sun age drowned these giants. Amazingly, they also held that during the final flood of the ancient time, the sky itself fell to the earth. Does this not sound like a vapor canopy collapse that caused the great flood? A common theme in Native American traditions is that in the beginning time only the sun was known, there was no moon. However, in the flood traditions of these same cultures, the moon is called the mother of the sun. This mystery is answered by the memory of the vapor canopy. The vapor canopy appeared just after the appearance of Luna. I have shown this in my Chronicon as 4039 BC. But the great flood event was actually the collapse of the vapor canopy in 2239 BC. During the vapor canopy period, the sun was unknown, never seen, and the moon was the great mother. When the sky fell, the sun was suddenly born again. An old Winnebago legend tells of a time when the sun was captured. At that time, in the old days, people were not the chiefs and did not hunt animals. Animals were the chiefs and hunted people. The Cherokees said that in the beginning there was only darkness and people kept bumping into each other. An intriguing piece of data comes from the Zuni myth, Coyote and Eagle Steal the Sun and Moon, wherein it is said that back when it was always dark, it was always summer. Now that is curious indeed. No sun in the sky. The daytime was dark, and yet the climate was summer-like. This strange phenomenon is, is again confirmed in this Zuni tradition. Coyote was a poor hunter because of the dark. They came to the Kachinas, a powerful people. The Kachinas had the sun and a moon in a box. Coyote opened the box, and the sun and moon escaped and flew up into the sky. This gave light to the land, but it also took away much of the heat. Thus, we now have winter. In the legend of Raven and the Sun of the Shemeshon people, we find, Once the sky had no day. When the sky was clear, there was some light from the stars, but when it was, but, but when it was cloudy, it was very dark. The ancient American stories tell of a world that did not have a daytime like we understand. 
It was dark, and yet under the shadowy canopy it was hot, like a summer climate. The appearance of the sun actually caused the world to cool. These facts are derived from Star Lore of Native America, assembled by the researcher Brad Snowder. And these elements are further confirmed in this amazing American tradition. The Pacific Northwest tribes of the Shimshin culture of North America remember their hero, Raven the Giant. The beginning of this tradition is, at one time there was always darkness and never daylight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Raven the giant lived in the sky, and there was light up there, but below the sky it was very dark. The air is described as a mist that sometimes cleared. The tradition reads, When the sky in this world of darkness was clear, a little light came from the stars, but when it was cloudy there was only the blackest night. Raven the giant was a hero because he devised a way to bring the light above the light above down to the ground where people and animals lived. The legend states that Raven the Giant found a water source in the sky hidden near a hole. Raven the Giant stole something from the people of the sky called a Ma, and he took it back down to earth and broke it. Suddenly the dark world was filled with daylight and many frogs that had Heart that had harassed him formerly were frozen solid in the cold that the light brought with it. The final element of interest here is the name of the hero, Raven the Giant. It's a memory of the megafauna, the gigantic ravens and birds of the vapor canopy world. I have published two petroglyphs that show giant birds carrying humans in their beaks. It is a theme in Native American traditions that in the old world the hunters were animals, not people. And I have shown much evidence that the ancient settlements of the world were giant. They had gigantic walls and roof fortresses because people were defending their communities from large predatory animals like Cattle Hoyuk, Gobleki Tipi, and Jericho. Before the flood, it was a lunar based civilization with stellar timekeeping systems under a vapor canopy. Once the vapor canopy collapsed, then according to ancient American traditions, the sun was born. Leading Sumerologist Samuel Noah Kramer observes that the original Sumerian gods like An, Enlil, Enki, and Ea were all before the flood. But later in history, a new god of Sumer appeared after the flood swept over the land. This newly appeared deity was Utu later in Babylon called Shamash, the sun god. This mystery as to why the more prominent object in the sky was only introduced to the pantheon so late and after the cataclysm has never been explained. But we know in Archaics, the sun was hidden during the vapor canopy, and when the canopy collapsed in 2239 BC in the month of May, Sumerian civilization was already old and in decline. Utu appeared only later in Sumerian tradition because the sun appeared only after the collapse of the canopy. It was for this reason that the deluge hero was named utu Napishtim, the Sumerian Noah who is mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The later Babylonians acknowledged a former watery sky. In the Babylonian creation epic Enema Elish, the sky is made from the body of Tiamat, a sky dragon the goddess of watery chaos. The victorious god Marduk splits, splits her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he set up into, and sealed her into the sky. In Genesis 1-1 we find the linguistic equivalent of Tiamat in the Hebrew word Tiham, the deep, when the firmament above was established. The biblical psalmist also left us a record. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Psalm 143, 3-4 The ancient Vedic tradition also knew of this vapor canopy. In Aitareya Upanishad 1-2, we read, Water is up there beyond the sky. The sky supports it. So the collapse call caused colder temperatures even though the sun was now visible. 
northern and southern extremities froze, and this scenario explains yet another series of intriguing mysteries. Proof this ice pack has not been there, but for a few thousand years is found in that Charles Hapgood and others have found and published old maps from four to six hundred years ago that show the geographical features of the, of the regions thought today to be packed with ice and snow. This means that the cartographic projections of Hapgood's maps of the ancient sea kings that depict an ice-free Antarctica and polar regions are actually copies of older vapor canopy era maps. A world wherein everything was larger, a world of darkness and continual heat with no seasons, an ecosphere where animals and people healed faster and lived longer. A world that will return in the month of May in the year 2040. During the Old Bronze Age, the concept of the world was more sophisticated than we have been led to believe. They called the Mediterranean world, which to them was a new world, they called it Middle Earth, which is literally the meaning of Mediterranean. In Spain, in the legend of Cadiz in Spain, the pillars of Hercules had split open and the Mediterranean world was flooded. This world, Middle Earth, was a beautiful paradise region of lush forested valleys with a chain of freshwater lakes. The Mediterranean Sea that you know of today was not there in the 4th millennium and 3rd millennium BC. It did not exist. It was a series of freshwater lakes. One day, the land bridge, the pillars of Hercules that connected Europe to Africa, broke. The Atlantic Ocean burst through the Strait of Gibraltar, filling the tree-filled valleys. The sudden incursion of 100-foot-high walls of foaming seawater drowned over 200 cities and hundreds more communities in floods like little fingers race through the lowlands, cutting off the escape of untold myriads of communities. Only birds crowding the skies in the west gave any warning that death was approaching. By the time they heard the distant roaring of the raging deluge, as it moved hundreds of miles per hour, it was too late to attempt an escape. Whole occupied lands were submerged as Sardinia, Corsica, and Sicily were separated from the Italian-Tunisian land bridge that vanished under the new, new surf, totally isolating Malta. The Atlantic seawater walls spread over northern Africa as quakes caused a subsidence that sank the Giza complex pyramids below the surface of the newly formed Mediterranean. The quake that broke the Gibraltar wide open was the same as that which lowered the Delta region of northern Egypt. The walls of water pushed northward through the Aegean, creating thousands of islands. The force of the world's entire sea level pushing the Atlantic onward to penetrate the Dardanelles and create the Sea of Marmara before bursting through the Bosphorus land bridge with violence to fill the freshwater Pontus Lake in the creation of the Black Sea. We're talking about a wave of water, a tsunami, that washed over entire cultures and civilizations that left not a single trace that they had even existed. This is where William Ryan and Walter Pittman in Ian Wilson's research enlightens us while also committing chronological blasphemy. These men put forth the theory that the Black Sea Flood was that of Noah's Flood, but they isolate the Black Sea from the cataclysm that actually produced it. The Mediterranean Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Black Sea, today all of the same level, were created from the same sudden devastating event and ever remembered as Noah's Deluge. They further date this Black Sea flood 3,360 years prior to the 2240 BC dating virtually every ancient and authoritative source produces. A concise review of their popular theory will demonstrate these errors. Ian Wilson, in Before the Flood, cites Diodorus Siculus, a man who wrote over 2,100 years ago, concerning a reference to flooding in the Aegean that separated Samothrace from the mainland, leaving it an island when the great Pontus Lake was over flooded. Wilson notes that, the, that Diodorus to Diodorus, the flooding of Samothrace in the Aegean and that of Pontus Lake, the Black Sea, were contemporary.
separated as they are only by the Dardanelles Islands and the Bosphorus. Wilson, Ryan, and Pittman are aware that the Mediterranean Aegean broke through the Bosphorus to flood the Black Sea, but they are unaware that in 5600 BC there were no saltwater Mediterranean or Aegean seas, only scattered freshwater lakes. In modern times, over 200 known sunken ancient cities have been located far beneath the Mediterranean Sea. The majority of these cities are of unknown origin, which easily provides us a general date for their drowning. The locations of many of them reveals that the Mediterranean Sea was once no sea at all, that this was within the Old Bronze Age period. The Mediterranean Sea had been basically the same from the earliest times from which tradition and letters were passed down in the region. However, to have sunk in unknown cities that were not of those civilizations during the Middle and Late Bronze Ages would, reveals that they were a part of an earlier civilization that occupied low-lying low -lying valleys and plains, only later drowned in a single devastating flood that the deluge waters never left records for. This particular flood was the creation of a whole new sea, eerily reminiscent of the Atlantis plunging beneath the waves. Their model would push back the construction of these 200 plus cities deep beneath the, today's Mediterranean to a time before 5600 BC, and this is absolutely untenable. There are no human writings that date to that period. Wilson notes that American Bob Carlin aboard the research vessel Knorr found evidence of a one-time massive underwater sedimentary avalanche at the location where the Bosphorus joins the Black Sea. And this is exactly what is expected to be found if a tsunami carrying a tremendous amount of debris that had washed from previously unflooded areas hundred, hundreds of miles per hour it was just carrying all the detritus as it went and just plunged over civilization after city, over culture, community, and just obliterated those regions. Scientific evidence shows a rapid transformation from a freshwater lake to a larger saltwater sea. These men document the scientists that produced these results. A drowned former coastline, an old shoreline, was discovered at a depth of 358 feet under the surface of the Black Sea by oceanographer Dr. Petko Dimitrov of Bulgaria. At the bottom of the Black Sea bed is a 40-inch thick layer of sapropel, which is mud thick with decomposed plant and animal remains from a prior freshwater lake. Their 5,600 B.C. date for Noah's flood completely defies every interpretation of biblical, pseudepigraphical, ancient textual, and Haggadoth rabbinical, that of Callisthenes, Marcus Varro, the traditional uh, deluge dating of the Chinese, Near Eastern, and even Old American accounts. It violates every chronological theory that we have based off hard chronological evidence from texts that, that have survived to today. 5,600 B.C. is 2,800 years prior to the well-established construction date of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which by testimony of multitudes of ancient sources was built centuries before the flood of Noah, a construction date equally supported by carbon dating to the 29th century B.C., not once, not twice, but 14 independent carbon dating studies. Ian Wilson supports this 5,600 B.C. date by the official but ridiculous date of Cattle Hilliard. Let me repeat this. They're dating the Black Sea Flood by what they believe the date of Cattle Hilliard is. It's a circular reasoning. But this site is known to have 14 levels of occupation, built one on top of the other, suggesting about a thousand years of settlement. The problem with this scenario is that Catalhoyuk is nowhere near as old as publicized. It was buried after it was abandoned, and in 1961 through 1965, excavations at the site by Millart, an archaeologist named Millart, uncovered surprisingly good sanitation, a well-ordered refuse system, white plastered walls painted with abstract textile-like designs. 
landscape paintings, breeding and domestication of bovines, cattle, the use of wheat and barley to bake bread, crafting baked clay statuettes, one of a woman wearing a very brief miniskirt blouse with shoulder straps, also basketry and exceptional woodcrafting pottery, the use of polished obsidian mirrors and boring holes through small beads as well as the art of metallurgy. At Cattle Hulluk, Carpeting on the floors was found to be of an exceptional quality comparable to the finest woven today. Everywhere else in the world, these innovations did not appear till after 3439 BC. Wilson's own use of Cattle Hoyuk's discoveries actually aids us in discarding the false antiquity of Cattle Hoyuk and their own 5,600 year BC date for the Great Flood. Cattle Hoyuk's sophistication is contemporary with the Harappan and Sumerian of the same period, 2600 through 2200 BC, the four centuries preceding the great cataclysm that we know of as the Great Flood. Ian Wilson shows how at Cattle Hoyuk the great mother goddess was worshipped and the bull cult flourished. Depictions of the goddess show her giving birth while enthroned between two leopards. The goddess between two leopards motif was specifically a pre-Diluvian symbol known widely throughout excavated Near East sites that date to about 2600 BC to 2240, the date of the cataclysm that ended the matriarchal dominance, not 5600 BC, an absurd dating, especially because Wilson also cites the 1968 discovery of archaeologist Paul Lapp, who found at Tanakh in northern Israel an 11th century BC artifact depicting the goddess Astarte frontally naked between two lions beside a young bull. Wilson notes the association of Catalhoyuk's mother goddess. Now you have to understand, the 11th century BC is four, over 4,000 years after this 5,600 date that they propose. There isn't a single religion on this planet that has remained unchanged in 4,000 years. In fact, aside from Brahmanism, I can't think of a single religion on this planet that's been here 4,000 years. The leap of 4,600 years passes through 35 centuries for which we have archaeological data and wherein are found no great mother goddesses between leopard artifacts. Wilson seems to recognize this major distance in time. In his bibliographic note in chapter 10, number 4, he wrote, After the desertion of Catalhoyuk, the 6th millennium B.C., there follows a long period for which the record remains a blank. But that's not true. The record has never been blank. Nothing has been found in confirmation of this cult's high antiquity reaching to 5600 BC because the civilizations that revered the great mother goddess did not even develop until after a widespread awakening post 3439 BC. You can't find what's not there. Wilson provides more evidence that Catalhoyuk nor the Black Sea Flood occurred so early. In Before the Flood, he notes the similarities between Catalhoyuk and the Minoan civilization of Crete. The Minoans were a cattle people who worshipped the great mother goddess, were adherents of the bull cult, and bull cult, and prior to the discovery of Catalhoyuk, the Minoans were virtually the first known people to paint their walls with landscapes, to plaster them, were virtually the first known people to even use that type of artwork in their public places and in their personal dwellings. Ironically, Wilson further notes that 4,000 years separated his dating from Catalhoyuk and the great Minoan culture. Even the horned shrines of the Minoans were identical to those at Catalhoyuk. So are we to believe that 4,000 years truly separates these sites, especially because of their proximity? Bull sacrifice, bull fighting has no American or Oriental counterpart, nor African or even Northern European counterpart. In the ancient world, it was Middle Earth. It was very distinctively Mediterranean Minoan and dates only to 2600 through 1400 BC. This most devastating incursion of the Atlantic Ocean that created the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, and the Black Seas ended this antediluvian practice of bull sacrifice and mother goddess veneration and gave rise to the worship of Poseidon, the god of the sea and the god of earthquakes. He 
after the great cataclysm became the preeminent God worshipped by sailors because they feared the earthquakes that caused the tidal waves. They feared the floods. They feared the oceans. Poseidon began to reign elite because the cataclysm was a demonstration of his power. The Catalhoyuk sh horn shrines are similar even to those horn facades found at Malta, where the images of the same fat great mother goddess were also found. He also notes that the labyrinthine interior of the Hypogeum on Malta is very similar to the layout of Catalhoyuk. The widespread Bronze Age motif of the double axe, also called the labrys, has been found at both Catalhoyuk and the Minoan Crete. All of these examples and more infer the two cultures were contemporary and that the Minoan chronology is the correct while the Catalhoyuk is pure fantasy. Just because a city is buried under deep mud and earth does not give cause to extend its antiquity beyond the evidence. The link to Malta is also chronologically decisive. The floor of Malta temples were covered in about three feet of silt. On Malta, the archaeologist Elol wrote, all this destruction caused by, by a colossal wave of water rushing from west to east can be witnessed in the Stone Age megalithic ruins of the Temple of Hagar Kin. When one examines these ruins closely, one will easily see that the wall facing directly westward has been completely destroyed. This wall, which had to bear the brunt of this gigantic wave, followed by a rush of water in its wake, would not withstand the onslaught. Gigantic blocks of stone from the western wall have been blown off their original position and piled up in a heap. This terrible force of water was the Atlantic tsunami that created the Mediterranean Sea. As the Minoan civilization dates to about 2500 to 1447 BC and Malta was destroyed by the Mediterranean flood itself in 2239 BC in the month of May, it was a Phoenix episode. Wilson's own arguments contradict his own 5600 BC dating of both the Black Sea flood and the antiquity of Catalhoyuk. No human architecture has ever been found dating to the 4th, 5th, and 6th millennium BC. Not even Gobleki Tipi dates to the 5th millennium BC. The fact that a settlement was buried in layers of mud is not evidence of high antiquity. Even many European cities today, not even 8 centuries old, have been rebuilt several times due to floods and quakes, often with newer infrastructures erect, uh, erected on top of the older levels. Malta was the center of the megalithic culture builders of the region. The design of architecture has been found as far as Sardinia. The monuments belong to a pre-Mediterranean culture. This is a scientific acknowledgement that a civilized people existed in the Mediterranean or Middle Earth before the Mediterranean had become a saltwater sea. In other very interesting that Bellamy in 1931 didn't buy the religiosity, the Babylonianized Jewish version of the sons of God, that these great angels had sex with human women and gave birth to giants and all that. Bellamy translates that passage much like I do. The Anuna were humans, technologically sophisticated. They were survivors of a cataclysm, and they were all male when they landed in their ships. Therefore, they required local females. And the offspring of those local females were very much like the Anuna, or sons of God. Yeah, Bellamy, man. Bellamy impresses me because he does never mentions Anunnaki. You know, it's way before Zechariah Sitchin. He never mentions any of that stuff, but he put the picture together based off all the data he had at the time. And that, that's very interesting. The first female being we read in the myths of the Jews who was fashioned out of loam at the same time as Adam was called Lilith, but she was intractable and would not, would not subordinate herself to the will of her spouse, saying, are we not both made of the same substance? Remember, you, you see, well, you have to understand in this book, he's explaining the loam, where it came from. It's the fallout that comes from the sky that our ancients thought was their ancestors liquefied. And it falls down as red rain and red mud all over the sky. And according to 
Bellamy, the ancients, believed that that material, that red mud that fell from the sky from the cataclysm, is what God scooped up, put together to make Adam and Eve. This is a profound belief. It's absolute proof that what I've told you guys, that Genesis chapter 1 is a reset story. It's not a creation. It's been masked as a creation by Jewish redactors. It's total reset. The world was absolutely destroyed. And here Lilith is throwing it in Adam's face. Are we not made from the same material, which is the organic compost left over from their, the, the, the world before? So, this was not a bit to the liking of Adam, and he bitterly complained of his wife's stubbornness to his maker. So, he was separated from her, and Lilith became a vampire, which preyed upon the offspring that Adam uh, uh, had from his second helpmeet, Eve. This is how Eve was created. God sawed Adam in two. With her, as she was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, he, th then they got on very well. It's kind of choppy, but that's how he wrote it. Guys, what we have here is the demonization of a female who didn't get along, who wasn't going with the program. We have, a, we have here an image or the transposition of an older series of beliefs onto this newer Jewish belief. Lilith represents the goddess. Lilith is demonized into a vampire and a succubus. But that's only from a patriarchal perspective of which the Jews maintained. So it's a very interesting this creation story pulls all these elements out and that Hans Bellamy was able to, to put this together. So he says, the antediluvian shore dwellers seem to have been quite aware of the impending disaster and fully prepared for it. Some of them even built their arcs on high ground so as not to have them dashed in pieces on the shore when the first huge breakers of the deluge rushed inland. They waited for the waters to rise and carry their well-appointed vessels away. The only reason I wanted to mention this, that Hans Bellamy did, is because I've told you guys in the past that the story of, of Noah and only eight souls, it, it's, it's a part of an ancient syllabus. It's where the Egyptians got their Agdoad. It's the reason why uh, this ancient syllabus was taught by, by the Amuru, and they spread it to all these different areas and kingdoms, but it's not true. It's not true that only one ark survived. Hans Bellamy knows it's not true either. It's right here. Many people knew that this was coming, the phoenix, and they prepared for it, and many arcs made it. And that's how our world was repopulated. Not by one, but by many. So we're talking about whole fleets. Again, we're, this is a hint that things I've been telling you guys is true. We were technologically advanced before the flood. We were able to prepare, project, see all these things. We were probably running simulations then. Yeah, this is a... I love Hans Bellamy. Love this guy. Another thing he said that stood out. He says, The great fire still finds a distant echo in the, in the following, the flaming sword of the angel before the gates of paradise. Now we know from my own research, I've showed multiple times that year one of the Annus Mundi calendar was 3895 B.C. Also, independent of that analysis, independent of, of all these different chronologers that determine that as well. There's many of them that determine that, that 3895 B.C., not just Stephen Jones, there's several, that 3895 B.C. was year one of the ancient world's calendar. Guys, that's when Phoenix appeared. In the Phoenix chronology, it's totally independent. Phoenix appeared in 3895 BC. It was, Phoenix is what caused that reset. This is why Hans Bellamy keeps a distance from all this material. He's only mentioning these in passing. And he's very clear to let the reader know that the Great Flood and all the events of the pre-flood world, the building of the pyramid, uh, of the Great Pyramid, and the Tower of Babel that was copied off of that, the model off of that original story. He says, the great destruction that was the creation has nothing to do with what he's talking about. Yes, the cataclysm caused by the capture flood is something different, and we're going to get into it. Gotta love Bellamy, guys. He says the Arawaks of British Guana 
say that the wickedness of mankind so enraged him who lives on high. Ioman Kandi, I guess that's in the name of God, that he twice ordered a general destruction. First, he scourged the world with fire, and then he flooded it with water. A few men, however, however contrived to escape from each catastrophe. They found refuge from the fall of fire in underground caverns. While at the time of the great flood, the ancestral chief, uh, marijuana, <laughs> it almost sounds like marijuana, and his followers were able to escape in a canoe. A flood of fire preceded the great flood. And there's a distance in time between these two events. So, Bellamy here is telling us, telling us that humans lived in the underworld for a while. That's exactly what we find in Turkey, ancient Phrygia. It's Turkey today. I don't know. You could call it. It's go. It's gone. That area of the world is gone by so many different names. Lydia, Lydia, Phrygia, Turkey, Hittite, Anatolia. It's all the same area. That's where the sixty underground cities have been found since 1962. And remember, I told you in prior presentations there is a legend that it was, that we have preserved of a king called Anakos who foresaw coming calamity and he built a city under in the underworld and he hid his people in it to save them from what was going on on the surface yeah i don't know hans bellamy never never cited that one but he did cite cite a whole bunch of others so having gone through all that i had to exhaust some of these some of these ideas and concepts because you've got to understand the mind of the individual we're dealing with here in order to appreciate the data that he brings to the table having now examined and found that bellamy was indeed knowledgeable about the true history of the old world that our predecessors did believe there was a time before the moon appeared we will examine what he says about the capture flood Bellamy says that we must recognize that these myths are by no means the wild conjectures of an ignorant age about the beginning of things. Rather, we must regard them as the finished, though much worn, much overgrown outcome of close observation. Myths are not immensely exaggerated tales of local happenings, but matter of fact reports of universal events. Myths, to stress it once more, have a real material background and describe anti-historical happenings, of which only geology has up until now been able to give some account. He says the Tupi, this is a Native American people, they describe in their myths how the moon, with them, was the personification of all evil, falls periodically on the earth and destroys everything. Even nowadays, all baneful influences such as thunderstorms and floods are believed to be caused by that evil celestial body, the moon. No less an author than Aristotle tells us in his Constitution of Tagaya, that the barbarous Pelasgian Aborigines who inhabited Arcadia before the coming of the Hellenes quoted as their chief title to the land the fact that they were already living in it before there was a moon in the heavens. Hence, the Greeks called them the Proselenians. Apollonius of Rhodes, we find a reference to the time when not all the orbs were yet in the heavens when there were yet neither Danai or Deucalion's race, when only the Arcadians lived, of whom it is said that they dwelt on the hills before the moon appeared. For instance, the tribes of the Chickabaws and the Mooks, Mook, you guys got to forgive me, I'm just not Native American. Mo, I can't even pronounce, Muikasas, Mazkas, who inhabit the plateau of Bogota in the eastern cordilleras of Colombia definitely state that they remember a time before the present moon became the companion of our world. The Okanagan Indians have the following myth. A long time ago, when the sun was no bigger than an ordinary star, 
the heroine or semi-goddess Skomalt, reigned over an island. When her subjects rebelled against her, she drove them all to a corner of her island, which she broke off and pushed into the sea. This is a description. The goddess is, is a represent, rep, she represents the moon. It is generally accompanied by a hieroglyph standing for the puma. Oh, oh, Bellamy's talking about the moon in, in, in native, in ancient, like, uh, Olmec, Mayan, Mayan, uh, reliefs. It is generally accompanied by the hieroglyph standing for a puma, a personification of evil, an indication that they feared the moon. So Bellamy wrote that man must have been fully man, an intelligent observer of nature, a skilled builder of ships and houses, a political being, by the end of the tertiary age, the time of the great breakdown of the predecessor of Luna. This means that the ascent of a definitely human stock must have taken place at a much earlier period. Now, I have to provide a little, a little commentary on this. This is another reason why the scientific establishment was so vehemently against Hans Bohr, uh, Horbiger and, and Hans Bellamy. It's because the theory of evolution has us coming from primate hominids and primitive Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, and then gradually through the Neolithic, we get smarter and smarter, more intelligent, and it takes us hundreds of thousands of years to become technologically advanced. Hans Bellamy is saying that according to the traditions and myths of the world and the archaeological record, things that we have actually found, the opposite is true. That we were we started technologically advanced and we have been we have been knocked down from the pillars of knowledge that we, that we once maintained. And that from cataclysm through cataclysm we keep we keep getting knocked down more the more technologically advanced we get. So this is Hans Bellamy's position, and it's, it's very good. Thus many people were fully prepared when the final cataclysm came and could escape death. From these survivors, a considerable number of deluge myths have come down to us. When the great capture flood came, this is their terminology. I did not make it up. When the great capture flood came, most people were more or less unprepared, for the measures taken with the lesser floods were useless in the face of it. Nevertheless, elaborate preparations must have been made by a far-seeing rulers in certain parts of the world. In the foregoing pages, we have repeatedly referred to the high standard of civilization of the Diluvians. They built ships to escape the Great Flood. They dwelt in cities, and they reared star-pointing pyramids. They observed the heavens with minute care. The catastrophic capture of Luna threw man back almost to the beginnings of his technical career. Again, here's another inference by Bellamy that it was, the, it was a cataclysm that took away man's technologies. My own commentary is insufficient to convey the magnitude of the following passages, so I'm going to read them to you, word for word. What an overwhelming and truly grandiose spectacle the capture of Luna must have presented to the beholder. One must picture the brightest of stars, far outshining Venus at its best, drawing nearer and nearer, increasing night after night in brilliance. On the eve of the capture, it appeared as a dazzling disk of, say, one-eighth of a degree in diameter. And that disk began to grow, and grow before the awestruck spectators. It suddenly increased to twice, four times, eight times, sixteen times its size. At its capture, Luna must have had, for a short time, an apparent diameter of at least one degree, doubling the width we know now. But how closely the grand is related to the terrible. The teeming population of the lost lands, of whose shining cities all that has remained is a distant gleam in myth and fable, having crowded out of Hudden Palace and Temple to witness the heavenly marvel 
suddenly felt an icy fear, a nameless terror. The air was full of forebodings. An unknown God had revealed himself before their very eyes in magnificence and splendor. A sudden shock sent the trembling crowds to their knees. A series of tremors and throes flung them prostrate, groveling in the dust. And from above, from below, from all around, came a thundering, rumbling, roaring, raging voice, uttering great words in a dark tongue. The houses heard it and crashed. The trees sh uh, shivered into splinters at its accents. The hills reeled and, and bowed their heads at its sound. The earth opened its womb and fire flashed forth. Blinding dust storms swept over the stricken multitudes. But the measure of their affliction was not yet full. Now the end came on. There rushed from north and south, advancing on a broad front, mountain-high waves, walls of water steeply reared. They swept over the land, seething, surging, tumbling, tossing, raging, roaring, burying all proud prince, crafty priest, harmless citizen in one deep, wet, cold grave. A few, very few, escaped. A man, perhaps, out of many thousands. But my tales of the lost world will, f will fascinate the children born into the new tales of vast cities, of houses taller than several hundred of our miserable wattle and mud hovels, of swift locomotion on the water and on earth and in the air, of the fast and far transmission of the world, word, of all the thousand and one wonders of our time, I shall often be regarded as an idle romancer, and after several generations my tale of facts will have become a myth, a story which the sim simple believe literally, but the learned they deride. Just as many of us deride the tales of our remote ancestors, such as the story of Atlantis. Imagination can easily com uh, complete this picture. It can also paint the frantic efforts of myself and my companions to save whatever there is to save of the science of the lost world, its arts, its, te its technology, an almost hopeless task, for it will be difficult to rediscover the materials, to reinvent the methods, to make tools anew. How long, how long will it be before our uncouth stone, bone, and wooden implements will be evolved? As for the getting of metals, I doubt if one generation suffices, and if the first generation, drawing on practical or theoretical knowledge, does not attain the efficient metal tool, the succeeding ones will find it extremely difficult, if not impossible. Guys, the, the point he's making is that when a cataclysm of this magnitude happens, it's a total infrastructure collapse. You're too busy trying to eat and shelter yourself to, to, to do, doing anything else. And if the infrastructure is collapsed, you can't make tools. Yeah, all you can do is make the most primitive tools. You can't make the tools that are really effective that will continue some type of infrastructure. You're going to make sticks and stones. That's all you're going to have. You, you're not going to be able to mine metals. You're not going to be, no metallurgy, no smelting, no casting, not turning it into make the type of tools that you need. This is what he's describing. It's it's a uh, it's very it's very realistic that that a total infrastructure collapse always follows a major cataclysm. If I imagine that a great and sudden cataclysm overtakes this busy hive of London or the swarming canyons of New York with the villages and hamlets of England, the backwoods settlements of America, and an un unimaginably great and powerful tidal wave sweeps me and a few of my neighbors, a sorry crew with nothing to call our own except the shirts on our backs, to some strange place scoured clean by the raging waters. Where is now our learning, our technical skill, our standard of culture? Though I may still remember a number of mathematical formulae, historical data, and general facts of what value are they to me. Though I can make things out of wood and metal, unless I have the materials and the tools necessary, I can do nothing. 
Soon the pain, the pangs of hunger tell me that I am really alive and I have to roam far and wide to pick up a few awful things or the carcasses of drowned animals if I'm lucky. These I must hammer at with stones to get through the skin and then I swallow some of the pounded raw flesh. This is, this is very, it's graphic, but he's explaining in detail here what we experience in the human family by these cataclysms. Unless you're in the underworld, you cannot maintain your infrastructure. This is why the elite go down there. This is why we have those facilities. Not all of them are going to make it. But the ones that do have their engineering. They've got factories down there. They've got gardens. They've got light. They've got food. They can continue civilization. So Bellamy continues with an analysis of the book of Revelation. He's, he's interpreting the book of Revelation from the perspective that is so it boggles the mind when you when you marry it to the archaic's data. I believe we live in a simulation. I believe that simulation is on a loop. It just goes on over and over in loops. And I believe there's one definitive window in, in that loop. There's one small break in that loop that always happens that allows those who are prepared for it to, to jettison out, to make their escape while everybody else goes back through the loop. It is my theory that the book of Revelation paints a picture of this loop. To find the same theory in Bellamy's material is shocking. He just says it in different ways because in 1931, the computer had not yet been invented. The frames of reference were different. In the apocalypse, a myth has been preserved, which tells us that there was a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay, he's quoting the book of Revelation. He's quoting the end book, the book of Revelation. He's making inferences throughout his entire text, Hans Bellamy is, is that the book of Revelation is only talking about a past event, an event that happened in the ancient world, and that that event happens repetitively. Therefore, the prophecy is actually scientific. A lot of things have been, have been attached to it, which he, which he discusses, but... Although he believes the book of Revelation is describing a past event, he admits that it's inferring a future event right here. A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The loop has, re has begun again. We're going right back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis cha in Genesis chapter 1, here it is, new heaven, new earth, year one, Annus Mundi. It all begins anew. The whole Adam and Eve narrative, the whole story I just told you about, Eve and Lilith, all this begins again. This is just the beginning of Bellamy's stuff. Like He says, in all deluge myths, whether of the eastern or the western hemisphere, whether told by peoples living near the poles or by tribes settling in the tropics, one fact always stands out. The Great Flood appears as the conclusion of a universal catastrophe, as the finale of a great cosmic drama. But though it definitely closes a period, it does not cause the final end of things. After the deluge comes the creation. It is a remarkable fact that the mythologist, though he knows an immense number of creation myths, cannot point to a single one whose report starts right at the beginning of things. In real myths, creation out of nothing is nowhere thought of. Creation ex nihilo. Almost everywhere we find the ordering of a chaotic muddle of pre-existing materials. We can now make another attempt to render Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 2 in clearer language. What is expressed by these two verses is something like this. In the beginning of the present eon, the Elohim uh, con conquered a primeval, a primeval bisexual chaos monster, Tohu Wabohu, in its primary meaning. In those days, the earth as we know it was not yet created. Only a primeval ocean and a primeval land mass existed. 
The Bohu land sank into the Tohu waters when the deluge came after the undoing of the Tohu Wabohu dragon. The breakdown products of the dying satellite spread a dense pall of darkness over the Tihom. Tihom is Hebrew. It comes from the Babylonian Tihamat, the chaos dragon, from which, according to the Babylonians, our world was created. The Bible starts with a scant amount of the creation of heaven and earth. It ends with a detailed vision of the end of this heaven and this earth, and the making of a new heaven and a new earth. Bellamy's not saying that we're on a loop, but Bellamy is describing a loop perfectly. He cites, he cites a biblical passage in the book of Revelation that I thought was pretty interesting too. He said, uh, uh, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. For all nations and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins. I want, I want to explain here. Bellamy is describing, he's, a, he's saying that the author of the Revelation record is describing the world as Babylon. I've showed you that, that in, in, it does. In, in the Revelation, it says the world is, is both Babylon and Sodom, like Sodom and Gomorrah. But this right here, is exactly what I've told you guys about the Exodus event happens in the middle of the apocalypse. The Exodus event is when all the redeemed, the chosen, the, the elect, the meek, that's when they make their escape from the what's going on during the apocalypse. They are freed from their avatars, and only because only in when they're in their avatar do they suffer the things of the apocalypse and of the beast kingdom. But they're freed. And it's here it is right here. When, when the apocalypse is destroying Babylon, the world, it says right here, come out of her, my people. It's not talking about the damned, and it's not talking about those who are going to go right back into the loop. It's talking about the errants. It's talking about the spiritual people who are ready to exit this holography. Come out of her, my people. Yeah, I thought that was profound when I seen that Bellamy made that connection. That, uh oh. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. It's time for you to it's time for you to exit the simulacrum. It's exactly what's being described. So, taking everything into consideration, we get the impression that the apocalypticians, I love that word, that the apocalypticians did not invent the cosmological skeleton of their stories, but based them on popular traditions of great antiquity. Their descriptions are too grand, too lofty, too logical, too clear to be merely the outcome of imagination. The presence of passages inconsistent with the tone and character of the whole has been taken by many scholars as evidence against the literary unity of the work. But from the foregoing considerations, the single authorship seems to be again admissible and acceptable. What answers this anomaly the scholars have isolated is that, as I've shown you in the Archaic's output, the Old Testament and the Book of Revelation, even the New Testament, these are are these maintain fragments of older works. Therefore, it's very hard to, to just say that it's all BS because those older works have been found in many cases, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Enema Elish and the Karsag tablets uh, so and the Keto Laramore tablets. We, don't, we, we find these all uh, frequently. We find evidence that the biblical material was copied from an older source. So what a... Uh, what Bellamy is inferring here is that somebody with very carefully put the biblical material together, at least the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, very carefully put it together using pre-existing writings and all that stuff. And it's the evidence of its choppy nature in different writing styles and the syntax shows that these were actually pieces of compositions that far antedate the books themselves. So... Yeah, uh, Hans Bellamy is just, he, he, the man's a genius, there's no doubt. So, another peculiar, peculiar, oh my God, peculiarity 
is that the writer, while mentioning many of the grotesque agents of the great cataclysm in the book of Revelation, never describes them exactly, but only hints at their shape and appearance or the noise they make. Something appeared in heaven like unto the Son of Man. Now, something appeared in heaven similar to beasts, a lion, a calf, a man, a flying eagle, or, and again, like unto is used over and over and over throughout, throughout the Revelation record. This is not common in other biblical books. So, uh, also the phrase, as it were, and like, is over and over and over used, as it were a trumpet. He goes all, he gives a lot of examples. The book of Revelation is describing one thing, but using words that hint that it's actually meaning something else. Over and over and over and over, the things that it's describing are mundane, ordinary things, but it's always prefaced with like, as it were, or, or it's just, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's evidence that the author is intending to mask what he's really talking about. And that, according to Hans Bellamy, the, the book of Revelation is about a cataclysm that destroys our world and that some people make their escape, while a lot do not. And that this cataclysm is ordained to be the new heavens and new earth. And that we're on a loop. It's all here. Just the frames of reference are a little different. He says, the apocalyptician projected the events of the dim past into the indefinitely near future and did so rightly. Therefore, both the preterists and the futurists among the scholars are both correct in their views. That's, that's amazing. Hans, Hans, uh, uh, Hans Schindler Bellamy is one, is one of my personal heroes. Love the man. The book, the book's, the book is awesome. And he wrote his book not not to build himself up on a pedestal. He wrote his book, Moons, Myth, and Mars, to defend Hans Horbringer, who could not defend. He was already old. Who could not defend himself against the scientific community that was now trying to take apart his new theory. All right, guys, this is not going to be an ordinary presentation that I do. We're going to fly through this. We have a lot of data to cover. So in order to establish that Bellamy really, really knew what he was talking about, and before we examine more of the capture flood data, let's explore what this man really knew. Let's see what, what he brings to the table. How does it comport with the archaic's output? I think you guys might be surprised. But, like I said, this isn't going to be an ordinary presentation. We're going to fly through this. And I have my notes right here under my camera. And Bellamy starts off by going through many ancient uh, uh, legends and myths, traditions, something that Hans Borger did not do. Hans Borger stuck to the science. Hans Bellamy brought a lot more to the table in 1931 to support the cosmic ice theory about the moon and its relationship to our world. So... He goes and he explains the Thunderbird of ancient times that was so feared by the Native Americans and gives a lot of, of, of associations and explains that the Thunderbird was nothing but the dragon of the old world. In fact, he goes into a lot of detail about there are two dragons that periodically show up in the sky and they bring cataclysms but the ancients always knew that these destructions were not the res they weren't re they weren't caused by a single dragon there were two different dragons that appeared over and he, and he says this and he shows all these associations in different ancient records what shocked me when I read the book is now a lot of the things in the biblical material that, have, that has been sanitized about behemoth and leviathan make sense uh, you'll have to read. You'll have to read his book to go into all those details. But he explains how the creation of the world, not, the dragons, were responsible for everything. So, um, yeah, it's just it's really. He goes into the Armenian feathered monster called Van and the Egyptian phoenix. He taught me something about the phoenix. I did not know that in Egyptian the phoenix was well known. It was called Bakbahu or Bahu, Bakbahu, which means to water or to flood. But the designation for the phoenix in the Egyptian hieroglyphs was three wavy lines from which we got Aquarius. So the flood. 
Uh, and, and you guys already know from my research, the Phoenix is what caused the Great Flood in 2239 BC. So I got a much appreciation for this material because he's coming from a different vantage point and he's, he's being very specific that the capture flood that involved the moon has nothing to do with the later Great Flood uh, of biblical fame. So I thought that was, that's, that, that's another very interesting point. So uh, he reads, a, uh, he, he explains an old cuneiform text at the time of the Great Flood. It was called the Year of the Raging or Red Shining Serpent, Year of the Serpent in the old antediluvian calendars, calendars. And he explains in Jewish myths, we are told that Leviathan and Behemoth always appear before a flood. In fact, and remember, Leviathan and Behemoth are the two dragons that appear in the sky. In all the dragon myths, the monsters only appear in times of stress. Yeah, it's... It's, it's a... He, I'm not going to go into all his dragon material. It's a lot. It's a lot. So, this book endeavors to show that the dragon myths and their inseparably close companions, the deluge and creation myths, are reports of the cataclysmic end of the tertiary age, of the catastrophic breakdown of the predecessor of our present moon. In Cosmic Ice, Ice Theory, we have a situation of two moons being in the ancient world, but they weren't here at the same time. There was a moon here before the moon that we have now, and it totally fragmented and broke apart and caused a, a, an epic cataclysm. Later on, this other moon appeared, the one for which we have in the sky now. And there was a period of time when civilizations were recording that there was no moon in the sky. This was the time between those two moons. So this is how this is the, the cosmic ice theory as presented by Hans Boringer and Hans Bellamy. So uh he goes into depth about the Greek mythology about Typhon. I showed you Typhon as fiend, the fiend, Typhon. The uh the you know, it's the youngest son of Gaia and Tartarus, Typhon being the phoenix. He goes into detail about how t uh, the phoenix brings flames. Uh, Zeus tried to attack it with a thunderbolt, uh, but the actual phoenix from the ancient world is the personification of volcanic and seismic forces. Remember all the volcanoes and all the earthquakes that I have documented that were all attached to phoenix phenomenon uh, dates. Yeah, he goes into he goes into that. And his theory is not about the Phoenix. These are just things he's throwing out there as he's giving his dissertation about, about all the traditions in the world and how they differ from certain certain threads of traditions that are about the moon. Uh, he, yeah, he mentioned sea crops. Sea crops appeared and started Athens after a cataclysm. Uh, he says, after the great flood, men were found no more. The hills and valleys were covered with a fine loam and loess. A legacy of the dead satellite, which was recognized as being a new, unfamiliar thing. Its brownish or reddish color all over the ground was taken as evidence that it was the material into which the dead had been transformed. So this cataclysm occurs in ancient times. Something breaks up in the sky. It rains all over the ground and the survivors see this red mud. They see this everywhere, and in their minds, this is what happened to their moms and dads and brothers and sisters and wives and husbands. What's left over after this cataclysm, because all the people are gone. The people are gone, and what's left is all this fall, a red fallout from the sky. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe when I read that. I was like, wow. Oh, uh, another thing that Hans Bellamy brought to my attention that I did not know about previously, I got it, fr I got it from his research, was that... Uh, he says the epic of the mundane era of the Maya, on the other hand, was established in the year 3373 BC. I have that in Chronicon. So, and then he says, by their calculation, it went by heptads of Bactons, or 2,760 years. He's claiming the Maya were measuring the periodicity of the appearance of the dragons in the sky and he says that their chief measurement was 2760 years this is divisible by 138 
and by the Phoenix Cycle of 552. Hans Bellamy did not know the Phoenix Cycle of, uh, he didn't, Hans Bellamy knows nothing about the 138 year chronology of Phoenix, nor the Phoenix uh, epicycles that we call Phoenix Cycles of 552 years. He doesn't know anything about that, but he knew this number from a Mayan text. That right there is profound. That's a data point. I need to add that to my to all my other ones. So, um, he goes into Peruvian legends that talk about the Great Flood, and he shows that in those Peruvian and ancient American legends, the Great Flood is very similar to the one in the Bible, like the Flood of Noah. It is totally dissimilar to the to the massive flooding that happened when the moon appeared. Two different two different e events. He said at the Great Flood of the ancient Americas. It lasted for five days, in which the entire time the sun was obscured. And I've showed this in my own research, that the Great Flood in 2239 BC, the sun darkened, which is a part of the Phoenix phenomenon. Let's see. Oh, I, I, he identify, he properly identifies Typhon and Phoenix with the ancient Egyptian Set. He says it right here, they are the same, and that they even had a nickname for Set, which was a Pepe, the Dragon of Darkness. Both a Pepe and Set are regarded as lords of evil and darkness, and a Pepe is also called the Roarer. This is very, very intriguing. Remember, Phoenix brings this thundering humming coming from the sky that vibrates all kinds of physical objects. Yeah, causes liquefaction, all that stuff. So it's calling a Pepe, a Pepe, Phoenix, Typhon, Set. It's all the same, same phenomenon. Uh, it's all described in ancient texts as being the very same. They are all, they are all just epithets for the Phoenix. And he's saying right here, the roar of Pepe is set. Yeah, uh, Hans Bellamy, he knew his, he knew his history. There's no doubt. We're going to get into that. He's a, uh, he's very impressive. So. He makes a statement, I'm showing it on the screen now. The awkward question which still remains to be answered is why did those contempora contemporaries of tremendous events, those deluge heroes, those divine ancestors who stood at the separation line of two world ages, why did they not call things by their real names and describe the overpowering thing in the heavens as a dying satellite instead of a living dragon? This is a very good point, but it's one that's covered in archaics numerous times. So much that I can understand why many of you would miss what I'm about to say. He is, he is asking the, the reader, why didn't they just call a spade a spade? Why didn't they just call it, it a dragon if it looked like a dragon in the sky? I mean, why didn't they call it a satellite if, if you know, the moon, whatever? But I have already explained multiple times that... There wasn't any, uh, there, we didn't transmit information written out the way we, they did in, in ancient Sumer and Babylon on clay tablets, burning them into kilns, because when this event occurred, the infrastructure was sophisticated, and we were writing on tablets or holographic templates and technological devices. We had technology, and he goes into this, you're going you're gonna to hear in this presentation, that, that he, he even goes into detail about massively advanced technologies existing in the ancient past. The, the moonfall of the old world ended that infrastructure. So these things were transmitted to us through more primitive frames of reference because two and three hundred years later, they had lost everything. We're going to get into that because he, he, he can say things better than I, I can explain to you. I'm going to, read you. I'm going to read for you what he has to say about these things. They're, they're very interesting. So we now move on and we're going to look at what Bellamy says about the Tower of Babel and the Great Pyramid. He says, the biblical tower myth becomes clear, however, if we regard the tower as what it really was, as a model of the mountain which safeguarded the ancestors, a model which, to a certain extent, practically, but chiefly, magically, was in its turn to save the sons from the deluge. The Tower of Babel story, according to him, was just that, 
a story after the flood, but what it's really talking about was the building of the Great Pyramid as a way to save the descendants of the builders. That's profound, and it's very relevant to the Archaic's output. So, he says, according to the myth preserved in the Bible, this tower of theirs was never finished. What's missing on the top of the Great Pyramid? From the very beginning, I told you guys that structure was never completed. Bellamy's revealing something, something to us very profound. So let's continue. The wicked wanted to escape this punishment concerning the flood when they're building the Great Pyramid. Hence the divine anger and hence a certain amount of divine fear. For apparently the tower builders had other thoughts in their minds as well. And if their plans were not nipped in the bud, nothing will be restrained from them, which they had imagined to do. As the Lord said when he came down one day to have a look at the city and the tower which the children of men, a tribe of different race from the one that he favored, were building. Yeah, this guy's very well read. He may have had access to a lot of materials that we just don't have anymore. But uh, this is this is some profound stuff. So he continues with with uh, Yosipan Mika Ben Gorion. This this is a guy's name. This is a Jewish scholar's name who wrote Sagan der Juden, Juden Volume One. So maybe that sa Saga of the Jews. Or legend, Sagen der Juden is Legends or Tales of the, of the Jews, Volume 1. So, it illustrates the memory of repeated floods and the necessity of propping the unstable firmament to prevent further cataclysms. The people of that time said, we know that in each eon, every 1656 years, the vault of heaven breaks to pieces. Let therefore strong pillars be built as supports, one in the north, one in the south, and one in the west. This tower here shall be the prop in the east. 1656 years is divisible by 138. All of you know who've been following my research. That's how long the great pre-flood period lasted. In the 1656 year, Phoenix appeared and the Great Flood destroyed the world. That, it's awesome. So he, he cites another Jewish myth. It may be from the same, same book, I don't know. But uh, on the next page he cites, he says, A tower, they built a tower high enough to withstand the onrush of waters, strong enough to resist fire. And in the tower... He said, and they said to themselves, and in the tower, let us put engines automatically discharging projectiles that kill anyone approaching who wants to take our stronghold by storm. So on the tower, they set a winged image. And he goes on all these other details. And then, he said, and then he says this, 1931. But the research was done before this. Hans Bellamy published robot guns with automatic range finders and aim indicators to be used against the god armed with thunderbolts. Even if this is only a myth in the ordinary sense of the word, an idle wonder tale, it is unique. He's still talking about the building of the Great Pyramid. His book is not about the Great Pyramid. So these are just asides all throughout his historical narrative. So he says, uh, their towers were the buildings of heaven-storming titans, attempting an offensive at great odds. According to Bellamy, the Tower of Babel is just a story in the Bible that's actually masking an, a real event, which is the building of the Great Pyramid, and that the people built the Great Pyramid because they had an idea to oppose the gods. They knew the gods were bringing these destructions on them, and they wanted to put a stop to it. It's amazing to find these things in this old book. 
He said, we have shown the connection between the building of the towers and the great flood, a connection which is stressed by the myths themselves, whether they come from the Eastern Hemisphere or from the Western. But we do not want any misunderstanding to arise as to the age of the ziggurat of Burr's Nimrod or of the Cholula Pyramid in America. Of, or of any other building now in existence, which may be classed under the tower heading. The myths are older than those buildings. That is amazing. He's absolutely correct. Burj Nimrud isn't very old. It's in, it's, in, it's in Iraq. Yeah, and the Cholula Pyramid is gigantic, but it's not the Tower of Babel. It's not the Great Pyramid, and, and it's not near as old. So... He says, nevertheless, the pyramids jut out into, into our world from the days before the dawn of history. And he's right to an extent. They do. Because the Great Pyramid of Giza, built and finished in 2815 BC, was finished before humans ever started transmitting writing onto, onto perishable and non-perishable mediums. Because when it was built, we were technologically advanced. We didn't have any... any uh, no reason to do to do all that. So now, let's go to the next section. So, Bellamy, he goes into some detail about the vapor canopy, but he never calls it the vapor canopy. To him, it's the firmament above. And it was a ocean that was suspended high in the sky. He says that uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, he says, And God said, Let there be light. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Bellamy says, What is meant is after a time the thick cloud cover came down in tremendous hailstorms and cloud bursts, and the difference between an unbroken light, light time and an unbroken night time became distinctly marked. Bellamy goes into a lot of detail that Genesis 1 describes a cataclysm and the renovation, the healing of our world after a total destruction, something that I've told you many times and in many presentations provided you my own evidence. Bell Bellamy spends a lot of time explaining this and how it relates to Genesis and Revelation. He says the snow mentioned in the above passages is, he's talking about the book of Ezekiel and other, pro, other prophecies in, in, in eschatology. He says the snow mentioned in the above passages is really the wreckage from the old shattered firmament, which is professedly built, professedly built of terrible ice. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22 and various Jewish myths. Recently, I have gone into detail about, about the glaciations and, how, and, and the false chronology of the Ice Ages, explaining that the collapse of the vapor canopy is what created that amount of snow. Here it is right here in Bellamy's own book. He, and this, is, uh, this, this, was, this was his theory way back then. So and remember, there's over 60 different theories as to how an Ice Age could even be possible. Scientists push it off as fact, but there are no scientists in agreement how, about how it could be possible because it requires humidity in order, in order to create that much snowpack ice all the way up. And we don't have that. There is no humidity at the, at, at the polar extremes. That's why today they only get one inch of, of snow a year. So something major must have happened to put all that snow there. It would have been very fast. This is the difference between catastrophism and uniformitarianism. These are the only two schools of historical analysis. You're going to be one of the other. Many people think they're catastrophists, but they use uniformitarian dating. Therefore, they're uniformitarian. They're not catastrophists. A catastrophist admits that we go by the evidence, we go by the traditions, and that and that the world can't can be destroyed and very suddenly and then four or four and five six hundred years later it can happen all over again uniformitarians is a different school and, and it try and it does its best to try to convey that all these catastrophes and all these events and myths and legends have over happened over hundreds of thousands and even millions of years all untrue so just remember that that is the distinction between uniformitarianism and 
catastrophism. Catastrophists have all unlimited data. It's all over the world. Everybody, everybody can see it for themselves. Uniformitarians have to come up with all kinds of arbitrary and abstract procedures to say the things that they say for a reason. They have to get you to agree that radio, radioisotopes break down at a certain constant because, it could, because they can't have any variance. It would throw all their carbon-14 and potassium argon dates off and all that. Yeah, there's, it's just ridiculous. All the, all the mental hoops we have to go through to accept uniformitarianism when very simply you can just be a catastrophist and go by the evidence. So anyway, we have a... Uh, he says that there's an Aztec myth says that, says that the moon itself was undone by a great fire. In the beginning, the world was a dark place. It was very dark in the world as the sun had not yet been created. The goddess Medzith knew that this state of things could only be remedied by a great sacrifice. So she built a huge pyre upon which she burnt Nanahuatl, the leper. Then she threw herself onto the flames. Thereupon the sun appeared in the heavens. This is a vapor canopy collapse story. She's the goddess. She's the, she's the goddess. She's the moon goddess. She was attacked, which was the vapor can canopy collapsing. Now, now she's no longer magnified at nighttime. Now she goes down to a smaller size. And now with the vapor canopy gone during the daytime, you can see the sun. You can see the sun just fine. Whereas before, all that light was diffused through the canopy and you just saw a brightness, you never saw the sun. Now that all the sun calendars began, the Aztec, the Aztec myth is very is dead on. He, he said on another page that this goddess, Medza, uh, who is also addressed as the bright and dark lady of the heavens, was avowedly the moon goddess herself. I love reading these old books. He says, we can gather from the extent of the so-called continental shelves that up to a certain period in the Earth's past, generally considered to be the later tertiary age, the land area of our planet was considerably greater. Then, however, and probably rather suddenly, the shelves were submerged. The oceans, it is believed, received great quantities of water which had been tied in the huge polar caps of the glacial period. We do not deny this, but this quantity would not have sufficed to raise the waters suddenly to their present level. We are therefore forced to seek their origin outside the earth. That's a profound statement, and I'm in total agreement. I'm in total agreement. Because the waters that he's looking for, that he thinks were peeled off the surface of the moon and pulled onto the earth to raise the ocean levels... They were, they were closer than the moon. They, they have nothing to do with the moon. The cosmic ice theory promotes that. But where the waters are that answers the mysteries of Hans, Hans Bor Horbringer and Hans Bellamy is the collapse of the vapor canopy. That's where all the water came for, them to, for, for the snow accrual at the poles and for the ocean levels to rise. It was the, it was the collapse of the canopy. So, so I... You can't fault him for not knowing that, though. Oh, uh, another thing he goes into is I can't pronounce this, guys. You'll have to forgive, forgive me. My northern brothers and sisters in Europe, you just have to forgive me. Those of you who've got that Viking blood, I can't pronounce this. Vorspia Hadi of the Edda. It's called the Spilling Song, and it's about it's called the Prelude to the End. But there is a it's uh it's in the Rinda one of the Eddas. But he goes into detail about it right here and talk, explains that even the ancient Norse, they had a story, the Germans. Uh, F-O-R-S-P-I-A-L-L-S-H-O-D-H. I don't know how to say that, but the spilling song is about the day, what, the day the sky fell. All this water spilled out, out of the heavens onto the earth. And uh, he talks about the mud rains. It's just really, really interesting, all these all these legends and things. That he's, it's just so, it's so... Yeah, it's just so crazy. So, when it talks about the the firmament of heaven and all that, Hans Bellamy really says something profound. So I had never made this connection before because I have never looked at the book of Revelation the way that he does. I'm starting to now. So, 
He says, the revelation of John contains the words, a door was opened in heaven. And then he goes on to ex explain that the word heaven, uh, aronos, is descriptive of a great covering, a great, a, a, a great shell around something else, a covering. I don't know. This is this this intrigues me because of my research into other areas and other ancient uh, enigmas. These these eyewitness accounts also in the Bermuda Triangle when the sky corkscrews and they and they and they have a feeling they're looking at a door. I said, "Wow, here's a door in reality. It's perfect because the clouds, the ocean, the horizon, everything starts corkscrewing as if it's totally artificial." And that they're looking at an image and the whole image just starts contorting and it corkscrews. And, and, the, and the general impression of some of these pilots is that I'm looking at a door in the sky. And, and the door was, was cloaked. And it was cloaked by the very reality around us. And so when I, so if I, I have to accept their, their testimony as true when you read so much of it and they don't have any other, I mean, these people have put their credibility on the line. Some of them have lost their pilot's license for, for coming forth, you know, coming uh, uh, out with a lot of these things. So uh, I accept that as true that many people have seen this because there's too many testimonies. So if that's true, I, I hear this about uh john sees a door was opened in the heaven it kind of makes you wonder now were there portals that allowed the vapor canopy to collapse is he talking about a portal out of the simulacrum or is it just another layer of the holography one that we can't perceive i don't know but it he, he makes this point and he goes into detail about these deals uh quite a few times that i'm a it bears. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to go through more of Bellamy's books. I've read another bu book about uh, the calendar of Tiwanaku, but there, he's got two or three other books. I need to. I need to go ahead and search and, and see deeper into this man's mind, because he's got some really interesting things. I, I just don't. I'm uh, really, I don't know. But anyway, we're gonna get into some more right now because Bellamy. Bellamy is gonna blow our minds now. Before we get into the actual history of the of the people before the moon and the moon fall the cataclysm and all that here's some things that just shocked me just random here's about eight eight or nine random things in the book to demonstrate his erudition how knowledgeable the man really was about the ancient world he says the mediterranean must be regarded as a very young sea because of the remarkable seismic and volcanic activity which we find it in its basin Remember, guys, I've, I've, I've cited the archaeological reports on my channel and the books of David Hatcher Childress. There are over 200 stone cities buried underwater in the Mediterranean. I have, I have videos that explain that the uh, Mediterranean was created in a day. In a day! When the, when the Strait of Gibraltar broke at the Great Flood in 2239 BC, that Walter Pittman and William Ryan are absolutely wrong about their Black Sea flood date. They're almost precise in all their archaeology up until the, up until the time they dated it at 5600 BC. They're off. They're terribly off. And it's easy to show by the artifacts that are found because they're contemporary with the 24th, 23rd, and 22nd century BC artifacts that are found and demonstrated uh, in, in, uh, in, other in other areas local that were not flooded. So uh, aside from that, I, I love their theory because it's absolutely true. All the damage on Malta, how gigantic megalithic blocks were strewn all in one direction. A tsunami came from the west to the east and blew it all apart and ended Malta. That's what the, the Great Flood ended Malta all those great you know huge temples like hypogeum and all that so to find that bellamy was mentioning something like this is really shocking i think i think there's another one. yeah the mediterranean was not in existence at that time in its place there was a number of small seas or huge lakes probably three in number again blows my mind because it's true the mediterranean ocean is a new it's a new sea the mediterranean sea the aegean sea tyrrhenian sea uh all that is absolutely new. Those were valleys full of people when that area flooded. So the Roman writer Claudius uh, Alien, he, he calls him Alienus, but that's, the, that's Latinized. Claudius Alien, in his Varia Historia, a collection of rare and curious lore, tells us that the Greek historian Theopompus of Chios mentions a talk between King Midas 
the king of Phrygia, and Silenus, in, in which the latter speaks of the existence of a great continent in the outer sea. Its inhabitants, the Meropes, were the builders of large cities. A lot of people believe that this is a reference. I've read, the, I've read all these little citations from Theopompus. Uh, Theopompus was, was awesome. Uh, Theopompus also told us that the, one of the first ages was 3,000 years. And uh, he was dead on accurate. 5239 BC, the beginning of the Anunnaki Nerd chronology, is precisely 3,000 years before 2239 BC when the phoenix appeared and caused the great flood cataclysm. Theopompus is dead right. Uh, Theopompus, a lot of people think Theopompus' reference here well, is an is a ancient reference to the Americas because at that time, the Americas were teeming with cities. They had not yet been destroyed. 31 BC had not happened yet. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, be it's a beautiful thing that Bellamy was aware of these things. And here's another one. Here's a shocker for those of you who have really been following the Archaics material. Here's a shocker. Hans Bellamy wrote that we also, we know also that an Assyrian period ended in the year 712 BC. What? 713 BC, what happened guys? Why am I a simulationist? Why do I hold so rigidly now to simulation theory? What happened in 713 BC that changed everything? And that couldn't have happened, but it did. We have all the proof in the world that it happened, but it couldn't have happened in a real Newtonian universe, in a real solar system. All the calendars changed, and yet nothing changed. It's, 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 it's amazing. I have several videos about 713 BC. Yeah, it's the year... It's the year the sun went 10 degrees in retrograde. 185,000 Assyrians wearing armor were vaporized by a flux tube, a blast from the sky. Yeah, it's uh, when all the calendars changed from 360 days a year to 365 days a year. And yet, the Nemesis X object and the Phoenix didn't change their periodicities. They maintained them. They maintained their their chronological integrity but the rest of the world and all its calendars was messed with that's really interesting so he goes off and says he says uh, uh the sons of god in genesis chapter 6 are only men from another body of deluge survivors probably of superior race who, roving the post-Diluvian jungles, found mates in the women of a tribe that called itself the family of men. Even the ancient Greeks divided humans between those who considered themselves to be earthborn and the rest of humanity. Our source today for much of what is promoted to be the Zodiac is found basically in medieval and renaissance period art and literature, the hermetic and alchemical treatises. Since those times of five to seven hundred years ago, you know, a lot of modern accretions have been attached to the Zodiac through orders like the Golden Dawn and authors in the 19th century and early 20th century. Across the Atlantic from Europe during the medieval period, though, the ancient American calendars did not recognize any sort of Zodiac, but were modeled on the old system of sun ages, sun periods, ages of the sun sun cycles. The zodiac as presented, presented today is largely derived from the astronomer Ptolemy in his Tetrabiblos, which dates about 19 centuries, maybe, maybe a little less than 19 centuries. It was at this time that we have the appearance of the New Testament, which has a lot of symbolism. Much of it is coded in astrology. But this was within 150 years of the appearance of the Old Testament, which is laden with old astrological motives. However, there is nowhere e anywhere in the entire Bible where the 12 constellations of the Zodiac can be found. It was at this time that we were told that the houses of the Zodiac were 2,160 years, thus the entire cycle is 25,920 years, and this is very popular for modern authors to cite who don't know what they're talking about, thinking this is a very ancient system when it's not. 
There isn't a trace of this belief anywhere in the world prior to Ptolemy. Now, this explosion of astrological data is more intriguing when we learn that Egypt's oldest zodiac is the Dendera zodiac. And, and anytime you Google it or you look at encyclopedias or you look on uh, books in Egyptology, they are real big on showing all the Egyptian motives and symbols, and, and it's beautiful. The Dendera zodiac is beautiful. Unfortunately, it's not even Egyptian. It's in Egypt but it was built by the Ptolemies. It is a Greek Macedonian zodiac, rendered and stylized to make it appear Egyptian. And this is widely known in academia. Yeah, the Ptolemies, uh, the, Greeks, the Greeks were ruling Egypt when this happened. Egypt as an independent nation was done. It dates to the first century BC. The oldest Egyptian zodiac not a trace of it in the prior 26 dynasties of Egypt. That's a problem. All of a sudden it appears when the Greeks are ruling. When Dendera, when the Dendera Temple was rebuilt. Yeah, this this is a this is this is bad. This means there's no recognizable zodiac in all of pre-Greek Egyptian history. Thus far, not nothing's been found. Now and that's saying something, because we have all the wall texts, coffin texts, we have, we have the funerary texts, we have, we have all the, 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 the Valley of the Kings. Yeah, that's a lot of Egyptian services to research. Karnak, the wall reliefs, nothing, no zodiac. Also, dating from this exact time is the famous Antikythera computer that was found in 1901 in the Mediterranean off the coast of Crete, an old shipwreck, and it was actually discovered in the in the in the in 1902 when they were going through the the shipwreck items and found that that it's unique. It's a computer. Yeah, you can see these pictures here. Now, it uses a Greek, a primitive Greek zodiac. It, too, is the first century B.C. It's all the same period of time. Everything compressed at that one period of time. Old Testament, New Testament, appearance of the Zodiac as we have it today. Yeah, so many things appeared at that, time, at that period of time. So, we have many history books. You know, they assert that the Zodiac was recognized, but there are no texts cited. There are no artifacts offered to substantiate the claims. Two and a half centuries before the Alexandrian Library period in China was the first hint that the Chinese knew of a zodiac. That was about 500 BC. And they recorded their astrology on the backs of turtle shells. Remember that. And this was four to five hundred years after the great poets Theognis, Hesiod, Homer, Man, these are 900 to 800 BC in their epic works that suddenly appeared in the world scene. We have, we have works and days, elegies, Iliad, Odyssey, these great these great works that survive today. These post Dark Age writers drew heavily upon the mythological, but they did not know of a zodiac. But this was five centuries, five centuries now after evidence of a Hindu knowledge of a zodiac around 1400 BC who claimed that the world itself was carried atop a turtle shell. The Chinese and the Hindu connected the world and calendars with a turtle. And this is made all the more profound by the fact that the belief is further maintained in ancient America. Turtles' backs have 13 sections that were sacred to the ancient lunar calendar. Hinduism derives from the older Vedic astrology, which was lunar-based, and this lunar system was embedded in the ancient pre-flood American calendar of the Maya, a calendar which counted 13 bactons of 144,000 days each under the 13 heavens. Curiously, Ptolemy fixed the zodiac at 12 houses, representing the circle of animals. But you know what? 18 centuries ago, he was aware that there was a 13th zodiacal sign. That's right. Very few people are aware of Ophiaclus. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Ophiaclus was the 13th sign. It was omitted in replace of a 12, a division of the heavens into 12, 12 sectors, the zodiac. Ophiaclus was originally, was also called Serpentarius, the old dragon. 
So the earliest zodiac was based on 13 constellations and was strictly a lunar-based system. So what happened to change this? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I'm about to let you guys have it. The ancient Oriental American and India cultures were matriarchal and they revered the goddess. You guys know I've got three or four videos on the goddess. They employed the lunar calendar. They revered the turtle as the keeper of time and oracles. These cultures, they also share the common trait of special attention being, being given to the Pleiades, or the Pleiades, however you say it. The seven sisters, the seven stars, the seven wanderers, and the practice of keeping oral traditions. During this period, the seven stars or seven sisters were clearly visible because the vapor canopy magnified the stars and moon by light. The antediluvian world lived under the vapor canopy when the sun was never seen. So, in the daytime, the sky was a dark purple light. Their world was humid and hot. And I'm reminding you of all these elements about the vapor canopy because they're going to be very important in this presentation concerning an ancient disk that's been found and translated. Society was very separated between the millions and millions of goddess peoples and the minority of strangers among them who, who stayed behind walled enclosures and underground dwellings, the Anuna. In Genesis, animals are mentioned in the beginning, the creation, but this was a reset, a new beginning, a cycle. Animals are mentioned again in Genesis in the flood story. Animals are loaded onto the Ark of Noah who survives another cataclysm. The cycle is now over when the, the day the sky fells, fell. Suddenly, there is entered into the traditional period the circle of animals, which we call the zodiac. Before this event in 2239 BC, there was not a hint, not a hint anywhere of a knowledge of a zodiac recorded anywhere in the world. During the Vapor Canopy world, the chief stories and constellations involved the Seven Sisters. And when the disaster occurred, disaster being the, the meaning of evil star, comes from two roots. Disaster is evil star. So the ancients witnessed this evil star appear, and then it destroyed their sky. The collapse of the Vapor can Canopy ended that world. And because the magnification effect, I, I've described to you guys many times, this magnification effect of a watery mesosphere was no longer there after the Great Flood. This is why only six of the Pleiades can be seen today. It was, it was this ancient world that venerated the four stars of the corners of heaven and the pole star, forming the cosmic pyramid. But in their traditions, the old pole star moved to Alpha Draconis. It was Alpha Draconis. It moved away from there, the Eye of the Dragon, to the Bears. Ursa Minor, the new pole star. The dragon had fallen. And so, this post-reset astronomy, after the flood, adopted the 12 house zodiac, dropping Serpentarius. The dragon had fallen. The 13th was omitted from the 12. So, with the fall of the vapor canopy also came the birth of the sun calendars and four age, the four age calendars, the four sun ages, starting with the water sun. In the Sumerian pantheon, the established Sumerian god suddenly introduced a whole new god into their family, called Utu, also called Shamash, the sun. In this way, we see the moon is older than the sun because it was hidden by the vapor canopy. This cataclysm broke, broke the power of the matriarchy and the new systems and governments were quickly overrun and patriarchal rule was established. During the vapor canopy, there was two competing dynasties, the ten kings opposed to the seven kings. The seven kings were begun by a matriarch, but the ten kings who were defeated were a patriarchal society. The same ten kings that found its way into the traditions of many people and discovered in the narrative of Atlantis like the ten patriarchs in Genesis. This pre-flood lunar-based reckoning of 13 months a year is why the destruction of Atlantis could never have been when Graham Hancock and others have dated it at 9,500 B.C., but was in the 13th century B.C., contemporary with the Sea People's Federation invasions involving Mycenae, a Greek nation, pre-Greek nation. So it fulfills the story of Atlantis in Plato. 
The 13-month system also makes sense in the Genesis genealogy. Suddenly, Methuselah, who is 969 years old, under the new lunar base reckoning, is only 74.5 years old. 969 divided by 13. He is 74.5 years old before he dies. Kind of makes sense now. Before Cataclysm, it was a peaceful matriarchal. My matriarchy. After the Cataclysm, it was all patriarchy. The Zodiac appeared, and it was male-oriented, with a male hero performing the deeds of the Zodiac. Remember Jason and the Argonauts? Remember uh, Hercules performing all the labors? Yeah, these are Zodiacal stories. Even if the Zodiac isn't mentioned, it's what it developed out of. So, this, this patriarchal takeover. Before the Flood, the constellations that are noted by the ancients are not in the Zodiac. They are Booties, Origa, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, Orion, the Bears, Ophiaclus, and Draconis of the Pole Star. These were the star groups that were used in the pre-Flood world. They're not Zodiacal constellations. These are navigation stars. These are the primary stars used in navigation. There was no knowledge or use of a zodiac pre-cataclysm. With the vapor canopy collapsed by the falling of a star, the cycle was over, or the circle of animals was complete, with their rescue aboard the ark, a vessel that would carry them through safely to begin another cycle. This appeared in ancient Babylon as the Mul Apin, or the Shining Herd. The origin of Apin is from the older Sumerian reference to the phoenix, or Apin, found in also in ancient Egyptian writings as the Pin deity, P-N deity, and I've showed you guys this in my phoenix presentations. The Apin began and ended the pre-flood world. The Mule Apin, or primitive zodiac, began around 1900 BC, which corresponds with the unusual fact that this date for the most ancient cuneiform tablets also. That's that's uncanny parallel. Writing exploded only after the cataclysm, and it seems to begin as a primitive cuneiform that quickly gets more sophisticated. However, there is a single artifact that demonstrates a precision and sophistication unlike in anything that we find in later Near Eastern texts. This mystery relic is called Babylonian Tablet K8538, and it is an eyewitness account of the Phoenix destruction in 2239 BC when the sky fell. It is a copy of a Sumerian original, as is many other Babylonian documents. The K8538 document is the world's it's the world's first scientific documentation on the approach of a terrestrial object of a, like a large comet to, that impacts Earth. Observations were made on top of an astronomical tower. The scientists that put this report out also say that these are scientifically precise observations that, and that the author of this ancient disc recorded the trajectory, distance, and even employed trigonometry. Scientists believe it, it indicates a destructive date of 2193 BC, and this is very close. This date is actually 46 years away from the total infrastructure collapse of all Bronze Age civilizations. It's very close. What makes it even closer is the scientists admit that 2193 BC is still an approximation. We have examined the Enuna Nur chronology and found that it involved the belief in a lost star, a lost world, and a people who became lost but were regarded by others as gods. The 600-year timeline involves the journey of worlds, planets, away from a dying star, Nemesis, to the present soul system. We have learned that our own world, Earth, is itself an intruder planet. It was followed here by the first world, Apin, or Phoenix, then the moon, and last in the historical record appeared the Nemesis X object. Many today call it Nibiru. This timeline is verified by many species of analysis, and we, do, we will not revisit those here. My videos are for those who seek to earn the truth, not have it given to them. We found in this chronology a problem with the destroyed binary solar system, planets catapulted from the dying sun to the younger soul. 
This is referred to as the Anunnaki Nur chronology because of the actual historical references in the Near East text of the Anunnaki being associated to the stars, to timekeeping, and to the specific number 600. In 4039 BC, a dead world from the Nemesis system was caught in Earth's orbit centuries after Earth first appeared here. This was the capture of Luna and caused the capture flood. Hundreds of millions of people died. Civilizations collapsed. The Anuna were already thriving on Earth, many having survived the Nemesis destruction and freezing journey to Sol in their deep Earth biospheres. 600 years later, exactly the Nemesis X object passed through the system on its 792 year orbit, as disclosed in detail in my Anuna files. It was the year 3439 BC. The Anuna, led by Enki, entered the historical record, and while the sensationalists assert only the later Babylonian superstitions of the Anuna descending from the stars, this was only half true. In distant antiquity, the Anuna did enjoy space travel, but in the historical record, in 3439 BC, the Anuna led by Enki arrived by ships on the watery seas. Copying this history in Babylon, the Jews understood the chronology in their own copies, and they called Enki by the name Enoch. And this is why the biblical date for the birth of Enoch is the same as the arrival of Enki. It is the 35th century BC. But this arrival was not accidental. This was 600 years after the capture flood caused by the moon. Now, in 3439 BC, Nemesis X object passes close by and it kills a third of the human race in flooding, which is called the Gihon Flood, for which I have revealed in prior videos, posts, and published books. The American civilizations of the Anuna were totally wiped out, and this is why fleets of males appeared all over the Old World in the infancy of Sumer, Egypt, Urartu, Anatolia, Harappa, the Yangtze Valley in China, and the Urumbaba of South America. 600 years later, we have the beginning of the Anunnaki dynasty starting at Badtabira, the seven kings of Sumer, in 2839 BC, and the birth of the hero, hero Noah, who was the progeny of a union of gods and men. 600 years later, we have the epic and worldwide renowned Great Flood. The Anunnaki nerve system marks the appearance of the moon, which caused a cataclysmic flood. Then the appearance of the Nemesis X object to cause the Gihon flood. Now the Nur chronology marks the great flood of Noah and biblical infamy as the year 2239 BC. And true to form, it is another object from the dying Nemesis system that causes this most terrible of flood catastrophes. It is the Phoenix. The Earth, the Moon, the Nemesis X object, and the Phoenix. These are the themes of the Anunnaki Nur chronology. The flood date of 2239 BC is not in question anymore. With so many ancient citations, scientific, scientific reports, chronological calculations, the traditional evidence, chronometrical references in the architecture of the Great Pyramid of Giza, or modern mathematical scrutiny uh, that's found in my videos and books, I am no longer compelled to attempt to convince anyone of this truth anymore. In fact, we can set aside every single piece of evidence and proof we have that the Great Flood was in 2239 BC and just simply rely on the Phoenix chrono chronology of 138 year resets, mud floods and cataclysms and still we get 2239 BC as the date of a vast destruction. In 2239 BC, every civilization on Earth suffered a reset. The fact that it was widely remembered as the single worst catastrophe in human memory should not be surprising once we realize that it is the nexus that connects the Anunnaki neurochronology of 600 year periods to the 138 year appearances of the Phoenix. 
that the nerve system and Phoenix chronology converge on this fateful year necessitates a closer examination of how these two systems interface throughout the centuries and millennia after the flood. It is my position that these are simulated protocols designed to preserve situational truths while appearing random and even natural. They are anything but. I will show that not only are these a part of the simulated holography masked as history, but that by carrying out the full program timelines of 600 year periods, 138 year periods, and 792 year periods of the Nemesis X object, as we have preserved their appearances and effects in the historical record, not only will it become obvious that we can predict the next series of events that will occur in our lifetimes today from 2022 onward, but if the history and future of the world is structured as a holographic simulation, then the present is all simulated as well. This is the second Phoenix Holography Chart video. In the first video, we covered the actual 138 year timeline of the Phoenix as presented in the Phoenix Archive Playlist 46 videos and my published books. This chart shows only four dates in history, guys. All four of them, though, are Phoenix years. These four dates will provide us a fifth date hidden in the pattern that is connected to the origin of the Phoenix itself or its reprogramming, a reset protocol. Now, you, already got, you guys already know, I say it all the time, the Phoenix is designed to be a witness against the Archons. Therefore, anyone attached to the idea of the Phoenix must be a benefactor. So, in 4309, BC, a 930 year old civilization met with an end by the Phoenix, and the survivors rebuilt during a 414 year period, which is 138 times 3, till the Phoenix returned again in 3895 BC and totally destroyed the world so perfectly the survivors thought it was a new heavens and a new earth. Both of these destructions were worldwide, almost extinction level events, and that's a part of this pattern. The second starting, the Biblical Chronology and the Annus Mundi Chronology, both of them starting in tandem behind a Phoenix destruction. Now, it would, be, it would be 1242 years before the Phoenix visited destruction again, in the year 2653 BC. This destruction was during the Vapor Canopy period and led to the vanishing of the Anuna. Exactly 414 years later was the Great Flood. You guys know the Great Flood of Noah is 2239 BC. It is the day the sky fell. It is the collapse of the vapor canopy. It is the beginning of the historical record as we have come to know it. From beginning to end, from 4309 BC to 2239 BC was 2070 years. Now, the 414 year period was first published and brought to the public's attention by biblical chronologist Stephen Jones in his book The Secrets of Time over 20 years ago. He shows how the 414 year period has been found all through history and that it is attached to the idea of cursed earth. So from the fall of man, which was a curse, the 3895 BC Phoenix Cataclysm that began the old world's cataclysms to the to 2653 uh, BC disasters was exactly 1242 years during the life of Noah. But as I have shown in my published work and videos, Nostradamus in a private letter wrote that Adam to Noah was 1242 years. Interestingly, 1242 is exactly 414 times 3. So, this same... This same start year of 3895 BC is also the start provided in Stephen Jones' chronology and in 1656 years to the Great Flood itself. The researcher Rashi, almost a thousand years ago, wrote that the world is destroyed every 1656 years. In this pattern, he is correct. From 4309 BC to 2653 BC is 1656 years between destructions. Likewise, 3895 BC, which began all these old world calendars, to the year 1656 Annus Mundi, or 2239 BC, is 1656 years. 
between two great destructions. So, that the whole period from the first appearance of the Phoenix to the Great Flood being 2070 years only mirrors that which the ancient Inca told the Spanish that their own history began way back in the past with a 2070 year period. So, here's the chart. The pattern is clear and geometrical. But nothing in nature would actually be this perfect. However, all the chronological dates are heavily supported, and the individual periods are likewise supported by Jones, Nostradamus, Rashi, and the Inca. Look at the chart. Look how far back in history these four men were when they were writing about these periods that were thousands of years before them. Here is the real message of the chronometry, the epicentral year of this pattern, between 4309 BC, beginning of Phoenix's 138 year periods, and the Great Flood in 2239 BC, caused by the Phoenix. The epicentral year is 3273 BC. It is the exact year in the middle of this geometry. It is the year 621 Annus Mundi. 621 is half of 1242. 1242 being a phoenix sum of 138 times 9, and the number mentioned by Nostradamus in the ancient world. So, what happened at this time that is relative to the phoenix? What happened in 621 Annus Mundi, 3274 BC, during the vapor canopy pre-flood period? According to many biblical chronologists, including the chronology of Stephen Jones in The Secrets of Time, having no knowledge of the Phoenix whatsoever or the timeline of 138-year periods, Jones dates the birth of Enoch to 3273 B.C. or 622 A.M. What this means is, in the chronometry, we have a geometrical targeting of the exact year when the benefactor entered the simulacrum on his mission to set the captives free. Enoch, the ancient Enki, was physically born in 3273 BC, but he entered the Avatar embryo the moment of conception in 3274 BC. That's when he entered the construct to do what he did later, which, we, which I've discussed in many videos. Four dates provided this geometry and demonstrates that Enoch's conception, his entrance into the world, was the epicentral date marking the ancient world from 4309 to 2239 BC, a vast isometric projection in the architecture of the holography, the holosphere. Remember, guys, these are not arbitrary dates at all. And they will be proven more and more as this thesis continues. And we cannot be surprised. I have shown ample proof that the traditions of the old world link Enoch to the Phoenix, and both the Phoenix and the Great Pyramid are linked to the figure of Enoch, who served his purpose and then mysteriously vanished into the sky, according to the book of Genesis, because God took him.